Good evening, everyone. Uh, excited to uh, be with you tonight just to talk a little bit um, about your questions, because as I said, we've been, we're going to be starting a, a series on questions, and I still would welcome any questions that you guys want to send in um, or ask me or anything like that. I, I would love to deal with those. Um, but right now, what I wanted to talk about is the fact that we're just facing a very challenging time in our country right now, um, because we spent nearly three months in lockdown of some sort, and just as we're finally emerging from that, we're now dealing with really a lot of racial conflict, protests, and rioting that's going on right now. And I'm sure you've been um, hearing about these protests, and you might have some questions about what's going on, why is it happening, and that kind of a thing. Um, so to kind of kick off this question series, I want to talk about just the question of what is a Christian response to the racial issues that we're seeing right now? So first, I want to just lay some very basic groundwork of, of how we respond to things. So to get a Christian response to anything, we need basically probably three major things. First thing that we need is we need to know the situation that we're facing really well. Because if we don't understand that situation, we might be doing the quote unquote right thing that we think, but doing it at the wrong time. And so it actually won't be the way that Jesus wants us to respond. The second thing that we need to know um, need to know is the Bible and God's values well, so that we actually have some guidance about how we should respond and what God's values are, so we know what to promote within the situation we're in. And then the third thing that we need is that we need to pray to have wisdom about how we can respond, because we can't do this on our own. We need God's help. So first, I just want to talk about the situation that we have in our country. Um, and it actually goes back a long way in terms of our history. As you might know, in 1607, we had the first successful English colony at Jamestown, Virginia. And only 12 years later, in 1619, that colony imported their first black slaves. Um, that was actually one year before the Pilgrims landed in Massachusetts and started that second English colony. So that's why you'll sometimes hear people say that racism is America's quote unquote original sin. Um, before, because before we even really got going as a nation, before we even had the pilgrims, we had slavery. And that slavery was, was an evil and it set us on a course to keep evil going on. And so in, in many ways, that decision to have slaves is kind of like the true uh, original sin of Adam and Eve eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was evil at the time and it set us up to make so many more mistakes since then. And as you guys know, as the colonies expanded and grew, so did slavery, especially in southern colonies, partly because of the landscape and the climate that favored that kind of agriculture. It was just useful to them, and so they did it. And then after the Revolutionary War, even as Americans considered the words of our Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal, the southern states continued to, to use slavery, and the northern states, though, decided to abolish slavery. Um, so that we had that kind of division. And the author of those words, Thomas Jefferson, saying that all men were created equal, he himself owned slaves, even though he acknowledged that it was wrong to hold slaves. Um, he was kind of a weird, uh, in a weird place in that regard. So, and as you probably know, though, the difference between those northern states that got rid of slavery and the southern states that didn't led to a civil war um, that was in many ways about southerners' fears of abolition the abolition of slavery, the getting rid of slavery. And ultimately, about 360,000 Union shoulder soldiers died in that attempt to, to free slavery, uh, to free people from slaves. Although, on the other hand, there were about 260,000 um, Americans who died trying to preserve slavery for the South. And it's not like just ending slavery ended our nation's racial problems, right? That was in 1865, and here we are over 150 years later, uh, since the end of the war in 1865. And, and we still have issues. Because slavery um, may have been the first racial issue that we had that started in 1619, but racism is a lot broader than that, right? It's not, it's just thinking that one race is superior to another or treating one race more favorably than another or being afraid of people who are different than you, that kind of a thing. And slavery in, in, the Amer in America lasted from 1619 to 1865. So it actually lasted for a lot longer than we've 
been without slavery. Um, and when we first got rid of slavery, there was an attempt to make things more equal, but then the anti-slavery and anti-racist white people kind of gave up pretty quickly. And white racists intimidated black people into submission after just only 10 years. And so that's when we started to get things like the idea of separate but equal um, that worked around the constitutional guarantees of equality and freedom. And then lynchings continued to become a way that um, people would just intimidate black people into accepting that they would have less rights than white people. They accepted their, their that because otherwise they might get killed. And if you just fast forward from that time into the 50s and the 60s as the civil rights movement began to really take root in the country, that was almost 100 years after the Civil War. It was almost 100 years of segregation and prejudice. And so the first incident in that civil rights movement that really started to garner a lot of national attention was Rosa Parks' refusal to move to the back of the black section of the bus when a white person wanted her seat at the front part of the, the black section. Um, that's when Martin Luther King Jr. helped to lead a peaceful boycott of the bus system in, in Montgomery, Alabama for over a year. And that began a series of peaceful demonstrations. But throughout that time of the civil rights movement, there were many protests and they were mostly peaceful and people like Martin Luther King Jr. insisted that they would be peaceful, but some at that time were not. And even the peaceful ones were oftentimes really inconvenient and bad for business because they would block streets and make it impossible to go shopping. And so that was a, a big problem. So even people like Martin Luther King Jr. who were peaceful were sometimes arrested and put into jail for their activities. And so you can imagine that in a time like that, relationships between um, African Americans and the police were not always constructive. And in fact, the police were often the ones who were expected to enforce segregation. Um, and not that things had been okay before the civil rights movement by any means because they didn't address lynchings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then one of the things that would happen after with some of these protests, um, not necessarily the ones led by Martin Luther King Jr., but um, other ones would um, become riots sometimes, especially actually after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. There were all kinds of riots that broke out in 1968. But that era, the civil rights era, ended with laws being passed that basically further guaranteed the freedom that had supposedly been granted in the Constitution. And you guys might hear the sirens outside right now. Um, that's because of all the stuff that's going on, right? We have um, these riots and these situations that, that are still ongoing. Um, but anyway, um, those laws were then guaranteed not only in this Constitution, but now also in more specific laws that kind of made it harder to get around the intent of the Constitution that all people should be equal. But as we know from looking around, around us right now, as you hear with these those sirens, that didn't end racial problems in America by any means, right? It just meant that the laws themselves were no longer explicitly racist and that there was supposed to be protection for minorities. But just like sin itself is in all of our hearts, in many ways, racism lives on in many Americans and its legacy created an unequal playing field that still exists today. And so that's why today, African Americans typically earn about 73% as much as white Americans. So that's actually a bigger wage gap than the wage gap you often hear about between men and women. There's a bigger white-black uh, wage gap. African Americans are also about 40% of the people who are in jail, even though they're only 13% of the population. So they're about three times as many as there would be if everyone had an equal chance of being in jail. And that's actually mostly because of unequal enforcement in, in terms of drug laws. White people and black people use drugs at about the same rate, um, but um, black people are much more likely to be arrested and thrown into jail for it. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but that's just kind of how the statistics show things to be. And African Americans are more than twice as likely to be shot and killed by police compared to white Americans. So if we look at a situation like the one that just happened with George Floyd, we have to understand that it's part of a much bigger whole, a whole history going back and a whole situation now where things are not really equal, where the playing field has not been, been leveled. So I'm not just talking about it being a bigger situation in terms of like, yes, there was also the killing of 
Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey. Now, it's part of this bigger whole, which is that whole history of racism and of Black people not being treated equally in America and not feeling like they have equality right now. Of course, we've made progress in the last 400 years, but it's not good enough. And I think we all know that. So as we look around and see protests and riots, we're left to wonder a bit of what's going on. Right, there's, there's very legitimate anger and frustration that we aren't seeing equality and justice in our country. And there's some very real fear that some people have that I might be the next victim of police brutality. Right, like I can say for myself, having been a witness to an officer involved shooting, I know that this kind of situation can really leave you scared and uneasy for a while, even if you're innocent, even though, and even for myself, I didn't really have any reason to think that the shooting itself was unjustified, but just seeing that made me a little bit nervous when I was around cops for a while. Um, and that's the case, even though the thing that I saw, I only saw and heard the very end, have no idea if it was justified or not. And unfortunately, in this case, the suspect himself did not die. He he had you know a gunshot wound, but he 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 survived. And so, of course, um, the looting and destruction that we see right now, even though there's real anger, we know that that's not justified, right? It does nothing to bring back George Floyd or anybody else. It does nothing to get the cops um, who were at the scene um, charged with murder. And it destroys the livelihoods of many people who are already dealing with basically destroyed livelihoods because of COVID-19. So the protests themselves, without the, that rioting and destruction, I believe are enough to get our attention and to help us realize that the situation does in fact need to change. When we look back on the civil rights movement, it was usually Martin Luther King Jr. that we look at and say, yes, let's change. And he did it peacefully. But anyway, what does this have to do with, with Christianity? Well, uh, if we're honest, it almost has too much to do with Christianity. Too much for the sake of, you know, finishing a YouTube video for you guys right now. There's so much stuff that relates to so many of the emotions um, in the Bible. And there's so much, um, you know, about race and ethnicity in the Bible. Even though it wasn't white versus black in the Bible, there is a lot of us and them. So I'm just going to lay out a few really big picture principles in the Bible with just a short little explanation, because honestly, this is already going to be a long talk, and we don't have time to delve into any of these fully, because I could probably talk the whole time about any one of these, these uh, five themes that I'm going to lay out. So the first thing that we need to know that I think relates what the Bible says about this kind of a situation is that God's goal is the inclusion of all people into his kingdom, right? Matthew 24, 14 um, is a verse that talks about how the gospel is going to be preached to all the nations of the world before Christ returns, meaning every, someone from every nation and tribe and tongue, this is another verse, will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is going to be someone representing every people group. Um, and it continues that idea from just from the very beginning, from Genesis 12, with Abraham's blessing that all the nations and all the, all the families of the earth would be blessed through Abraham. God has that vision of including everyone. I mean, Ephesians 2 and 3, which I talked about not just a couple of weeks ago, really, about the inclusion of the Gentiles. It wasn't going to be just Jews that are part of God's kingdom. It was going to be all the non-Jews too. And that was the secret. The secret of the gospel was that it's not just about me and God. It's about me and everyone else. That God has died for the sins that keep me apart from other people. Not just the sins that keep me apart from God. That is part of the gospel. So the true family of God is going to come from every nation and every race. So our true place of belonging is to that group of people from every background who follow Jesus, and we should see everyone else around us as equally created by God. The vision from God, in fact, is that we as Christians should all become one united people, just one united people, just as God himself is united as the Trinity, the three, you know, one God and three persons. So that's a huge amount of unity that we are called to have with all our brothers and sisters, no matter what color of skin they have. 
So let's try and be in unity with our brothers and sisters from every single race. The second thing is that Jesus models crossing cultural barriers, right? Jew versus Samaritan was one of the big, big uh, sticking points in Jesus's days. They were extremely intense. Honestly, probably more intense than the rivalry that we see right now between black protesters and cops in many ways, right? We've, you've hopefully seen some, some positive images of, of cops standing alongside protesters. That, like Jews standing alongside Samaritans, would have been even more mind-blowing because they had had about 500 years of bad blood by the time Jesus was doing his ministry, and they'd had numerous skirmishes over the years between each other. Honestly, both of them were pretty near the bottom of the totem pole in, in, in terms of the social standings in the Roman Empire. But about 150 years before, the Jews had actually kind of had the upper hand, um, 100 years, 150 years before Jesus' ministry. The Jews conquered the land that Samari the Samaritans lived in, and they actually destroyed their temple. Um, and about 500 years before Jesus, or 350 years before that, the Samaritans tried and failed to prevent the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. They didn't like each other. So as you may remember, though, from the Bible story, Jesus spoke uh, to the woman of Samaria with compassion and saw that she too could worship God truly and invited her into that, even though she was a Samaritan woman who had made some bad life choices. And so I think we should approach people who are different from us in the same way, be willing to cross that cultural barrier. The Bible also tells us how to respond to anger, right? So I talked about the racial issues, but the other issue is that we just get angry. Right? We look at the situation and probably one of the most natural responses is anger. And the Bible tells us what we should do with anger, right? We're not supposed to let anger to continue inside us and continue to grow. Like the Bible tells us not to let the sun go down in our, on our anger in Ephesians chapter 4. We're supposed to do the be our best to work things out with other people, as Matthew 5 talks about. And also in Matthew 5, it tells us that we turn the other cheek when we're wronged. So this situation is, is maybe weird because we're maybe angry with either the officers of, you know, who killed George Floyd, or, or maybe we're angry with leaders, and we don't have a way to really turn the other cheek to them or a way to, you know, work things out with them because we don't know them, right? And it would be normal for us to be angry, but, but there's not much that we can quote-unquote do with them. But what we can do is still make a decision not to let the anger grow inside of us, right? We can decide that it's not up to us to right these wrongs. Like, I can't fix the George Floyd situation. There's nothing I can do. He was unjustly killed, but I can't bring him back. It's up to God to, do, to, to right these wrongs. Our, our job is to point people back to Jesus. And we offer forgiveness, not because the wrongs that are done are small, but because we know that the God who forgives is bigger than any wrongs, always. And that the sins that we see in others are the same kinds of sins that we could commit, except that the grace of God is saving us from committing them. So we have to work on, on not becoming angry. Now that doesn't mean that we do nothing. I know that I said that it's not our job right? Because we can't make everything right. And that is true. We can't. God can. But as I'll, I'll talk about in a bit, we can be a part of what God is doing, but only if we let go of our anger and our drive to be the ones who do it. And the next thing is that we're told how to respond to grief in the Bible, because that's a natural response too, to see all of this and to be sad. I was reading in 2 Corinthians 7 the other day that there's basically, there's a godly grief and a worldly grief. Godly grief leads to repentance, but worldly grief produces death. Basically, our response to this, tr these tragedies that we see can either help us to see what is wrong inside of us. That's just a firework. It startled me. Um, what is wrong with us and, it, and with our people, whoever we identify with and repent for the things that we're doing. Or it can make us desire death and those who are grieving us or make us desire to just to not go on, right? 
if that's if we have the wrong kind of grief, worldly grief. So we want to have godly grief that forces us to reflect on ourselves and identify the wrong in us. And another biblical principle, the fifth one that I'm going to talk about, there could be many more, is that the real problem is sin. It's always sin, according to the Bible. That's the root of every human problem is sin. Satan, sin, and death. And that all got started for us with that original sin. And so we talked about how racism is really America's original sin. But even that, it goes back to sin in general, to Adam and Eve. And we know that with Adam and Eve, there was only one way of dealing with that sin. And I think there's only one way of dealing with America's problem too. And that is the blood of Jesus. It's the only thing that can set us free from sin. It's the only thing that can offer forgiveness that we need in order to break cycles of anger and fear that lead to more and more violence. Because only Jesus can really set us free. And only the love of Jesus can heal America's racial divide. That, that's what I think. So where does that leave us right now? So I think it leaves us with a deep need to pray for the world. It leaves us with a need for wisdom about how to handle the situation, a need to pray for peace, and a need to honestly examine ourselves. So I'll also suggest that, that we should start by remembering that God's goal is the inclusion of all people, regardless of their background, right? So if your tendency right now is in any way to be angry with a whole group of people, don't. Don't let that happen, right? Don't let the images you see on TV start to influence the way that you think of other people. Whether that is developing a fear of people of color because you see them rioting, or a fear of law enforcement because you see them enforcing the law, remember that those are all pe people that you see on TV that God wants to include in his family, and that the current situation of conflict is breaking his heart completely. So just be aware that if we're not careful when, when we process these images, we could develop a fear or a bias that we're not even really aware of. So pray that God will help you to have a heart to include, you know, whoever you're, you're maybe blaming for this situation right now. Pray that God would soften your heart to want to include those people in his family. And then I think another thing that's important for us to do is to try crossing cultural barriers. And I don't mean just this week. I mean, always try to cross cultural barriers. Talk with people who aren't like you. Start up a conversation with somebody who maybe doesn't look like you or comes from a different background than you, right? Now, I know right now with COVID restrictions and we're still semi on like lockdown from COVID and, and also curfew from riots, that might not be super practical in the short run, right? We might not have a chance to get to know new people. You can interact with, with different people that maybe you already know on social media or phone or whatever. But have that mindset that you're going to be a person who will cross cultural barriers the rest of your life. You can find really neat people when you do that and learn a new way to see the world. Um, and the other, another thing that we've got to do is we've got to look at our own anger and grief and ask ourselves, what are we doing with them? Like, how are we processing them? Can we forgive people? Can we repent from what we've done? Can we see any way that we can change? in order to build bridges rather than barriers. Because I think only when we do this, do I think that we actually have a real chance to have a productive voice. Only if we've already dealt with that grief and that anger. Because an angry voice invites anger. But a gentle word can bring healing. Right? That's, that's a biblical concept too. And so if we're gonna stand for the quality of, sorry, if we're gonna stand for the cause of equality and inclusion, for peace and for love, then we're going to have to stop worrying about the things that happened to us personally and to start stop being angry about those things that have happened to us or those worries that we have. Because when we, when we do that, then we can be a person of reconciliation in our, in our culture that's very divided right now. And then, of course, finally, I think the answer to this is that we need forgiveness that comes from Jesus. We all need it. And we all need the healing that Jesus gives. Because when Jesus forgives us from sin... He forgives us from its power so that we aren't slaves to sin. And in America, we are enslaved to the sin of racism. And it's only through the work of Jesus that we as a country can be set free. Otherwise, we all as, as people just kind of get tangled up in it. 
right? And even if we're not personally racist, just through the anger and the division and all of the inequalities that we have, we, we somehow interact with that, that sin of racism. And so what we need to do is come to Jesus and ask for him to set us free. And of course, for all these things, we need to pray and see how God um, leads you personally to, to respond, right? It's going to look a little different, our responses for all of us. And in many ways, this will really be tested once we're able to go back to socially interacting in, you know, the post-COVID world and the post-rioting um, world. But it is good to start making plans right now and to be praying right now about what that's going to look like. Because prayer brings healing better than honestly anything else. So when we have our Zoom meeting tonight, we'll talk about your questions and we'll also spend some time praying for this situation. And then I do want to just let you know if you're interested in just learning a little bit more about our nation's tragic racial history and to get ideas about how to respond, I, I'd recommend reading Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, I'll, I'll include a link when I post it so that you can find it pretty easily. It's powerful, guys, just to, to hear it and read it written to people like me who, you know, sympathize and want equality, but maybe don't do enough to take action. So it's a great reminder that we can't just allow injustice to continue. So some of the discussion questions that we'll have, um, we'll start with just what questions do you have? And we'll answer those questions if you have any further questions about this, these race issues. Um, the second question that we'll talk about is just what are your thoughts on everything that's happening? So even if you don't have questions, you might have thoughts and opinions that you want to share. The third one is just what are your hopes and fears right now um, as you see all of this going on? What, what's, what are the kinds of things that you're, you're either being afraid of or hoping for? And then number four is just kind of in many ways a review of what I've talked about, but hopefully you can make it more personal and practical for yourself. But how do you think we should respond as Christians? to everything we see going on around us. Um, so anyway, I look forward to talking to you guys and um, and to continue in prayer over the situation, um, both with the pandemic and then now with um, the protests and the rioting. Um, so see you guys uh, soon and look forward to that conversation.